Republican supporters of Donald Trump and his leading Republican critic are both all on the ballot tomorrow in Wyoming and Alaska between the two states. In Wyoming, Liz Cheney is polling 20 points behind her Trump-backed opponent, Harriet Hegman, paying the price for leading the House's January 6th investigation and, of course, voting for impeachment. If she loses as expected, her closing ad struck a national theme, reinforcing speculation that she might end up running for president. Millions of Americans across our nation, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, stand united in the cause of freedom. We are stronger, more dedicated, and more determined than those trying to destroy our republic. This is our great task, and we will prevail. And two well-known names are on the ballot in Alaska. Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski running for a fourth term, and Sarah Palin is hoping to snag Alaska's only congressional seat. Imagine Sarah Palin in Congress. Joining me now, NBC News correspondents Vaughn Hilliard in Jackson, Wyoming, and Ali Vitali in Anchorage, Alaska. And with me in Washington, Mark Murray, NBC News senior political editor. Welcome all. Vaughn, it's Judgment Day for Liz Cheney tomorrow, and it is not looking good in Wyoming. She's been under threat. She's not been able to campaign actively, uh, go out in public. Um, what are you finding from all your reporting? Right. And this is the moment. And Harriet Hageman, who is her Trump-backed challenger, a land use attorney, longtime GOP activist here in Wyoming, she has traversed thousands of miles holding little campaign events, uh, every small town in the state of Wyoming here. And, you know, from Cheney's side of this, you know, I, I'm, I'm told that Liz Cheney, uh, the case that she has been making here is that she's doing the job that Wyoming voters sent her to do, and that was to uphold the U.S. Constitution, go to Washington, D.C., and do justice as she saw fit. And that meant taking the helm as the vice chair of the January 6th Select Committee here. But when you are going around, Andrea, and talking to Republican voters around this state, you hear overwhelming dismay uh, on how Liz Cheney has spent her focus here. Ultimately, her impeachment vote, but then also the focus of the investigations into Donald Trump. And she is not shy in saying that that is her utmost focus, whether she wins or loses tomorrow, to continue to do the job that she's done on the January 6th committee, but also heading beyond 2022. I want to let you hear, though, from one voter who is voting for Harriet Hageman. And we often are hesitant to play some of the sound, which kind of sometimes dives into concern conspiracy theories, but I think it's important to understand here in the context as to why Harriet Hageman will, uh, is on the cusp of winning this primary. Take a listen. Why not Liz Cheney? Because she's a sellout. Yes, betrayal. Anti-gun, anti-American. Get out of here. She did not, she didn't back our man Trump like she's supposed to. Do you think that the January 6th insurrection did not uh, m amount to enough of a reason to have an investigation? They could investigate it, but then why aren't they investigating the FBI agents there that were implanted in the crowd and the people that were planted in the crowd to try and instigate stuff? <laughs> It's stunning. In, in so many ways, there's a great number of voters, Andrea, that are living in a different reality and a different subset of facts here. And the question was, since May, would voters shift? Would voters change after these public hearings? And frankly, for the most part, the answer appears to be no here, Andrea. I mean, it's just stunning that voters, after everything that has been said, everything that is available, available to them, still think that that crowd was incited, you know, as a false flag by FBI, FBI agents. You know, it's, it's really pretty dismaying. Uh, Ali Vitale, Alaska, is following other states and trying ranked voting tomorrow. It's complicated. Could it help Murkowski? It's a little complicated, but it's a system that could reward a candidate like Senator Murkowski, in part because experts tell us that women tend to do well in these kinds of systems, but also because it's a system that rewards people for moderation. I don't mean moderation in the political sense of the word. I mean moderation in terms of taking positions that are all-encompassing for a wide swath of people, consensus building, making communities feel heard. It's something that may not make Murkowski popular with Trump, who certainly has campaigned against her, saying that she's a rhino and that she's among his least favorite Republicans. No surprise there. She was among those who voted to convict him for impeachment, among other things. But at the same time with voters, it may be something that wins them over. Listen. 
I think she's taken some hard stances right now. She's supporting abortion rights, which is huge. Mm -hmm. And she's been willing to vote on some of the other issues and not go with her party. On that gun violence prevention bill. Exactly, which is huge. So look, Andrea, you heard there those voters talking with me about things that Murkowski has done over the course of the last few years, not just bucking Trump and speaking out against him, though certainly that's something that voters are deciding on here too, but taking policy stances where oftentimes she's someone who's crossing party lines to do it, a regular bipartisan actor. And what it does is it forces me as someone who covers Congress day in and day out, and you know this building so well too, to consider what it could look like if Murkowski were not a part of it, if you had someone who was more hyperpartisan in her Senate seat instead, the way that it would change the very face of the way the Senate is able to run because of the ever dwindling number of people who are willing to be bipartisan there. Now, that's not something that we're saying is imminent because the way that this ranked choice primary system works, at least in the Murkowski state of, of the race at this point, is they're in a top four primary. There are maybe a dozen candidates running for this open, for this Republican primary moment. Murkowski is expected to be in the top four. That means that then she advances to November. But certainly it does force you to think about the ways that she plays a pivotal and interesting role in Congress as Alaska voters decide here. Indeed. And arguably, of course, as Liz Cheney does on the House side. So, Mark Murray, let's talk about the ranked choice voting and how it first could affect Sarah Palin. Yeah. And so as Ali was just describing the the top four primary system in Alaska, and then you get to rank choice voting when you end up having the general election, the entire both systems are designed to reward candidates that have crossover appeal. And so when you look at Sarah Palin and when she decided to get into this House election, she ended up getting the most votes in the top four primary system. But her challenge then ends up becoming when you get to rank voting, are you going to be somebody's second choice or third choice as well, too? And there is another candidate in this field. Uh, Begich, who has, you know, who uh, his grandfather was a former Democratic United States senator. His uh, uncle was a former Democratic uh, senator. He is a Republican. But you can kind of start to cobble a situation on how someone like Nick Begich could end up having crossover appeal if everyone's strategic on how they're going to end up voting. And so, you know, I think it's going to be really interesting to see who ends up emerging on top. But Sarah Palin, when you're kind of designing a rank choice and top four primary system, would uh, designers would say this is a candidate that necessarily wouldn't benefit from this kind so of system. You, you would say that Democrats, if they're really being clever about it, would vote for baggage, a Republican, to try to shut out Palin from getting into the finals. Yeah, Andrew, there's a lot of gamesmanship. We saw this play out on that New York mayoral primary where they also ended up having ranked choice voting. And yeah, a lot of strategy comes for Democrats. There is a Democratic candidate on the ballot. And do they put that Democratic candidate number one? Or do they say, "My, I think I want to keep Sarah Palin out. I'm going to put Nick Begich number one here, too. And then it's going to take potentially days to count who ends up getting uh, a majority uh, if it ends up going to rank choice voting. And Andrew, there is still a chance that if some, one candidate ends up getting a simple majority on the first count, then we will know who the winner is. But the thing is that if it goes to a second count, then the, fan, the candidate was in third place, their vote gets reallocated to the second choice of other candidates. And that's where the math starts. Look, I was never good at math. So you've got to be here every day this week until we know what's happening in Alaska. OK, Pops. deal. Vaughn Hilliard, Ali Vitale in beautiful Alaska, Mark Murray, thank you here.